Welcome to Weather with Blake and Heather on VU TV's Channel 15. This is the show to learn about all things weather. I'm Heather Bricka, sitting here with my co-host Blake Harms. Well, on this week's episode, we're going to cover the tornadoes that battered Florida over spring break and the avalanche that affected Colorado. You also will want to miss how these hot sauce packets from Taco Bell saved a man's life. We're going to have that and more coming up on this episode of Weather with Blake and Heather starts right now. Welcome back. A National Weather Service survey team has confirmed a tornado caused the extensive damage in the Baum Road area of eastern Leon County Sunday evening. This is a look at the damage in Tallahassee. The National Weather Service estimates it was an EF3 tornado, meaning winds reached at least 140 miles per hour. Devastating. What about it was so devastating? Just losing everything you work hard for. The Leon County Sheriff's Office has 10 homes saw significant damage and half are destroyed. Two people in the area were injured and taken to the hospital, but their injuries were not life threatening. Now this loop animation from NOAA's GOES 16 satellite showing the line of storms moving through Alabama in the location of the deadly Lee County tornado. This EF4 tornado hit Alabama and killed 23 people, which turned many homes and businesses into piles of rubble. This mile-wide tornado saw winds of upwards of 170 miles per hour. The paths of destruction ended up being 24 miles long, and the tornado started in Alabama and continued into Georgia. The president and first lady ended up flying to Alabama immediately after catching word of the natural disaster. National Weather Service was able to confirm that this was a mile-wide tornado that touched down Sunday. President Trump said, quote, it was hard to believe the damage that he saw from the tornado, end quote. The Porch Band Creek Indians donated $184,000 in funeral costs for the 23 people that perished. What a great way for the community to band together in such a terrible natural disaster. That's right. Well, Camilla Bernal was in Lee County, Alabama, where the National Weather Service is expected to be on the ground as search and rescue efforts continued. Search and rescue operations underway as we now are beginning to see the damage left behind by the storm. If you take a look behind me, pieces of a roof on the ground, pieces of what could be a shed or a garage, everything picked up and dragged by those tornadoes. Now, we know that those operations are resuming today. There are canines, helicopter, drones that are now working in the most affected areas. Then they're working their way out, trying to find the missing. A string of tornadoes ripped through Alabama and Georgia Sunday afternoon. I'm scared just I'm on the counter and 10 seconds in the tornado come and everything is gone. Everything destroyed. Tearing roofs off homes and snapping trees like twigs. In Lee County, Alabama, two deadly tornadoes hit within an hour of each other, devastating the area. Came on pretty sudden, they had fair warning and then it uh, just hit with a vengeance and uh, it just destroyed a very large area. Search and rescue efforts had to stop overnight for safety reasons, but will resume at first light. And with that, the death toll could rise. We have multiple residences that have been completely destroyed. There are some juveniles uh, involved in the, uh, the fatality situation, uh, adults as well. The challenge is, is just the sheer amount of, of, da of damage and debris that's uh, all through the areas where the homes were located. Across the state line in Georgia, at least 15 structures were destroyed as the storm system moved east. Several injuries were reported, but none severe. Now the number of dead remains at 23. The sheriff saying the youngest victim was six years old. They say at least about 20 people are still missing. Reporting in Lee County, Alabama, I'm Camila Bernal. Now back to you. Well, that tornado damage was quite something. Now talking about the tornadoes that happened closer to us here in Indiana, there was an EF0 that confirmed by the National Weather Service which touched down in Lowell, Indiana. That tornado ended up being short-lived and hit around 1.50 in the afternoon on Thursday. Even though this was the lowest tornado on the EF scale, it still came through with 85 mile per hour 
winds and traveled one and a half miles. Now this lasted only a few minutes on the ground and lifted once or twice before uh, it was given the EF rating because the majority of the damage was fallen down trees and nearby reports said that the main threat for them was a lot of the hail that covered the ground during the time of the touchdown. And now speaking about those tornadoes, well, we should be talking about more about the Indian or the Alabama tornado outbreak. Yeah, that one tornado in particular in Wee County really did a lot of damage and uh, the deaths from that tornado actually eclipsed all the deaths we had from tornadoes in 2018. Yes. So we're already off to a violent start uh, to the year. Yeah, and it was well forecasted in advance, but it just hit a very populated area and it lasted six hours and 30 minutes from the time it started in Alabama and continued into Georgia. Well, the issue with that region and the Dixie Alley is that you have so many trees that it's hard. If you don't have the proper warning, uh, it's difficult to see it coming because yes. it's a very hilly terrain as well. So I have no doubt that that played a factor in it as well. Yeah, and I know that this is definitely going to keep the safety of tornadoes in the forefront of many people's minds because it is early in the season for this, but it is starting to become more tornado season. Yeah, we actually just had our Indiana uh, tornado drill today, and it came a little late because we actually had a tornado touchdown like we mentioned right here in uh, Lowell, Indiana. Yeah, yeah, it just came right after that, but I think everybody was kind of waiting for the, the tornado safety sirens. But this was the most deadly tornado since a more tornado that was an EF5 in 2013 for this area, which is a really big deal because the more tornado was pretty devastating. Right, absolutely. And, and there are uh, quite a few tornadoes. We had uh, 10 EF0s, 21 EF1s, 7 EF2s, and EF3 and an EF4. So. This wasn't the only one. There, there were, you know, quite a few that struck the whole region that day. Yeah, it was widespread from like top to bottom, basically, with basically every tornado you could get without hitting the EF5 range. And the total deaths was 23 and over 100 people were injured in this. Well, f fortunately and unfortunately at the same time, all the deaths came with the EF4 tornado, um, which granted the other tornadoes were weaker, but those could have been bad as well. So. For the most part, people are prepared at this point. It's yeah. just, it just when you hit, get that hilly terrain and, and, you know, even some tornadoes, especially if they strike at night, can just uh, can wreak havoc without you even really having much uh, notice. Yeah, and it did start in the early afternoon and continued into the mm -hmm. evening. So that was probably one of the, the biggest struggles of forecasting this is it's in the nighttime. It's hard to see. Yeah. And people just aren't prepared. But one of the EF3 tornadoes that hit Florida also was a second only tornado that strengthened in that area since 1945. Wow. Pretty crazy. So we're that, still in March. We're still in March. Yeah. There's definitely more tornadoes to be happening. We're going to take a break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about all the tornadoes that hit Indiana over spring break and all of us that are a part of the storm chasing team, how we were out of town. Of course. <laughs> Stick around. Welcome back. A tornado was spotted in Columbus, Indiana, in a Walmart parking lot, no less, on Thursday, March 14th. On top of that, Louisville, Kentucky saw a tornado also touch down on Thursday and also saw major damage due to the high winds that came with it. This was the same system that spawned the 24-mile-long tornado in Alabama earlier that day. This EF2 rotating funnel cloud touched down at 7.03 p.m. in the towns of Durand and Vernon, which are about 21 miles away from Flint. Dozens of buildings were destroyed, including up to 70 buildings damaged in just Michigan alone. Many trees fell down across the Midwest with peak wind gusts from Michigan to Indiana. All the way down to St. Louis saw winds up to 50 and 60 miles per hour. All severe weather enthusiasts were upset that they weren't in the area to see these vicious rotating clouds. And staying with the topic of tornadoes, many people are keeping safety in the forefront of their minds as tornado season is fast approaching. Many residents in Kokomo are rethinking storm shelters and building new ones for their homes. Now, residents in Kokomo are well aware of the dangers of tornadoes, especially around Palm Sunday due to the Palm Sunday outbreak of 1965. Wharf Excavating claims that they have installed over 30 safe rooms over the years in Kokomo. The owner of Wharf Excavating explained that the recent tornado outbreak in Alabama and Georgia and Indiana has people really thinking about their tornado preparedness. Now talking about this preparedness and the recent tornadoes, how do you stay safe in tornadoes, Blake? Well, I'm from West Michigan, so fortunately we don't have to deal with them a whole lot. But it's important to remember what to do. I think the biggest, most important takeaway from tornado preparedness is to have a plan in place. Yes. And to not wait until one's bearing down in your house to, to set that plan to action. 
Yeah, I also think it's important that you don't stay outside to watch the storm come straight towards your house yes. and take shelter right away. Yes, absolutely. Well, and, you know, we have the warnings and watches for a reason. The watches especially, they've really done a nice job of pinpointing the highest area of risk um, ahead of time. So, fortunately, we have all these resources. It's just a matter of using them. Yes, and... National Weather Service does a great job of keeping up-to-date information on their National Weather Service Twitters. So even following National Weather Service Tornado, it's a separate page, mm -hmm. and they end up sharing all the tornado warnings. So you know when to stay in your shelter, how long you should stay in your shelter, and when it's clear to Well, come and out. You'll, you'll often see that or get alerts on your weather radio before you see it or get an alert if you get an alert on your phone or before the tornado sirens sound off. So it's a great way to get warnings. Yes, it's a great way to stay more weather aware. And it's exactly how you need to stay prepared because of the Palm Sunday outbreak, especially in Kokomo. It was a very devastating event because no one was in their homes during that event. Well, even more recently, back in 2016, they had the surprise outbreak where they were hit with two separate tornadoes on the same day. So they're not immune to tornadoes, neither are we here. So it's really important to uh, take steps before tornado season really ramps up. It's already started, but before it really ramps up. Yeah, and we don't really see a lot of tornadoes here, but I don't think we're as prepared as we need to be, even though most of our weather meteorologists, majors are definitely well aware of yeah. them. I think the rest of the people in Valpo haven't really seen the tornadoes come, so they're not really aware as they should be. Well, that's the problem is that if you don't get a tornado in a while, people just let their guards down, especially if you have false alarms. A lot of the tornado warnings now are issued based off what's seen on radar, and that doesn't always mean there's going to be a tornado. Yeah. So if you have a few of those, the public starts to perceive that as a false alarm, and when the real one strikes, you know, it could be uh, quite dangerous for people who aren't prepared. Yes, and of course, people who don't see tornadoes for a while definitely are numb to the warnings, and I think they need to take more of the warning seriously because National Weather Service wouldn't be putting that stuff out if they really didn't mean it. Right, absolutely. And we present the same danger here as, as they did in Alabama to some extent is that, you know, we still have trees around here. Not as many as they yeah. have it down Dixie Alley, but, you know, you think you might be able to see it coming, but that, that's not always the case by any means. No, we still have valleys here, so if the tornado just hits a valley and comes back up, you're not going to see that coming. No. Well, and we also have great TV coverage uh, throughout Chicago, too. So it's always a lot of great resources, like we said, just a matter of using them. Exactly. And the, the TV stations do a really good job of covering those. Yes, they do. All right. Well, we're going to take a break. But when we come back, we're going to cover the bomb cyclone and how Taco Bell fire sauce saved a man's life. Stay tuned. Sticking with us. Now, we have a very interesting story about the powerful bomb cyclone that hit Colorado area which now is causing extensive flooding and rains across the United States. The cyclone came through with hurricane strength and started over Iowa and Nebraska on Thursday, which produced dangerous weather for over 105 million people that were under some type of watch or warning. Now this Bob cyclone occurred when the rapid pressure drops and has a decrease of over 24 millibars over a 24-hour period. This particular storm dropped 33 millibars from Tuesday to Wednesday, and the storm produced lots of snow, especially in Boston. We'll have more about that Colorado side just a bit, but meanwhile in Boston, they're hoping, they're saying, in like a lion, out like a lamb, ranks true this March. The month started with a blast of winter weather. Nearly 10 inches fell in the city on Monday as Tishana Whitwell reports it was apparently the city's biggest snowstorm of the entire season. Snowy start to your work week after a winter storm dumped nearly 14 inches of wet, heavy snow in parts of Boston. Plows struggling to keep up. Ah, uh, the roads were totally clear. The, the side roads were a little iffy, but the highways were clear. Mayor Marty Walsh said Boston dispatched 660 pieces of snow equipment with 26,000 tons of salt on hand to tackle any storm. He's reminding landlords and business owners it's their responsibility to shovel their sidewalks or pay a fine. Keep snow mounds low for commuters and never throw snow in the street. We saw this East Boston attorney making the most out of a snow day by capturing photos of snow-covered trees and buildings on Boylston Street. This is part of these, the essence of New England. It's, you know, snow and winter, hot summers, beautiful autumns, great springs. You know, embrace the seasonality. Don't, don't, don't run from it. I, I like the snow, I don't like the slush, and I don't like the cold, you know, but everything else is beautiful. Boston public schools and libraries closed today. The mayor ordering all non-essential employees to stay home so crews have plenty of space to clean up.
Boston is used to winter weather in March. The biggest snowstorm last year hit on March 13th when more than 14 inches of snow fell in one day. Now, two avalanches happened in one day. That's what hit Summit County on Sunday. The first avalanche came down 10 Mile Canyon along Interstate 70. Officials said that the highway didn't suffer significant damage and no injuries were reported. That afternoon, a second avalanche was reported a few miles away near Copper Mountain. More than 80 million people were under winter weather alerts from Colorado to Maine. Now let's take a look at video of the avalanche on Sunday on Copper Mountain in Colorado. Some vehicles had to be dug out. A second avalanche happened that day in the same general area. No reports or injuries were of anyone that were trapped and the avalanches did close part of inner. While well, sticking to the winter weather talk, get this, is Helsinki, Finland, the coolest city in the world? Well, arguably, yes, they are because Finland has some of the most brutally cold winters out of everywhere in the world. How do they do it? Well, most of them still enjoy doing outdoor activities like snowshoeing, running and swimming. The most popular way to stay warm for them is constantly using their saunas. The majority of homes in Finland do have saunas, and the origin of the sauna is actually from Finland itself. This is the one way the Finnish residents can stay warm and relax while it's intense sub-zero temperatures outside. The Finnish sure do enjoy the cold weather a lot more than we do in the Midwest. Now, continuing on the ice cold subject, we have a story about how NASA is concerned about an iceberg that is twice the size of New York. It's about to break off from Antarctica. Now, this ice is breaking off from Antarctica burnt shelf, and the scientists are worried about what this means for future research opportunists there. Now, the cracks have been apparently larger than normal each year, and NASA has been keeping an eye out for ice for quite some time. Now, the scientists are unsure about how the ice will break off, and that's concerning part because there is human life on this part of Antarctica. Now, NASA scientists are observing it to see if the loss will trigger the shelf ice further change and possibly become unstable and break off. Now, the bomb cyclone that hit Colorado, was that a sign that winter is still here? Well, Blake, how was that storm? Well, actually, funny you should ask, I flew over it when I was oh. still in Colorado. I flew back from Phoenix and we had to fly. We flew on the, the warm side of that, flying through the storms. But I talked to quite a few people in the airport who were flying home early to Denver because it was supposed to be such a mess. And boy, was it a mess out there. Yeah, I, I have an aunt that lives in that part of Colorado, and she was sending pictures of feet and feet of snow that were by her house, and they're not used to having that amount of snow there. And even, like, hearing about the avalanche, it was just a crazy story. Yeah, well, and there were some residents who had to leave their cars on the highways, and they became completely covered, and now they're responsible for digging them out. Yes. So I saw a video of them taking their own shovels and digging their own cars out. Unbelievable. Yeah, and even her neighbors were trapped in their cars, and she was taking videos of them digging out their cars and was like, well, the next neighbor has to dig out his car, and then another plow came by and plowed him back in. So he was digging out his car, and then the other neighbor's digging out his car right across the street. And wow. it's just a lot of snow for this time of year. Yeah, well, especially for this late in the season, we have tornadoes on the, the same system produced tornadoes. The one right here in Lowell, Indiana, yeah. was the same one that produced all that snow for Colorado. And now, indirectly is producing all the flooding in Nebraska and Iowa. And so mm -hmm. it's just a really messy system wreaked a lot of havoc here in the U.S. Yeah, and the system just has a lot of ramifications. And depending on how that moisture sets up and how the rotation that clouds happen, it could be a difference of having a bunch of hail from where you are to a tornado touching down to snow just piling your house in practically. Yeah, well, fortunately here in the Midwest, we got the warm side of that system. Yes. Had to deal with a few tornadoes, but just a messy system all around. Farmers were excited for the moisture for their crops, which makes a good start for summer. Mm -hmm. Granted, not as much as what they have in parts of Iowa and Nebraska, because they're going to be dealing with much more ramifications and just good amount of moisture. Yes. You know, with all the all the mud and, and whatnot they're dealing with there. Mm -hmm. And Russ Schumacher was interviewed because he's a climatologist down in Colorado, and he came for GLMC last year. Mm -hmm. And he was saying that this moisture is really good source for the farmers and the farmers are excited about the moisture. But last year was just like a whole 160 turnaround because yeah. they like had just dry land and they couldn't get enough moisture. So they would rather have this latter part of the system than not. Yeah, well, we're going to take a break. Before we go, though, we have a story about some Taco Bell sauce. Yeah, stick with us.
Welcome back to this episode of Weather with Blake and Heather. Now, this winter weather events here and across the United States, we're going to see a slight warmth in our temperatures this weekend. Blake, how does the weather look like the next coming week? Well, right now it's looking awfully nice. We're in the upper 40s, and it looks to stay this way for at least the next week. 48 here in Valpo, 50 in Gary, 49 Joliet. Very warm temperatures considering it's the evening time right now. Across the region, it's pretty uniform. 53 over in central Illinois. We're a bit cooler up north as expected, but man, these warmer temperatures are going to continue slightly above average, but it certainly feels like spring is starting out there. Radar right now is quiet. We have a little bit of light rain that'll be working its way into our region here overnight tonight into tomorrow. We'll time that out for you here. But first, travel watch looking on I-94. It's pretty nice outside. Sun is just set or just setting right now. Traffic is clear. They had a lot of messy weather to deal with this year, so it's certainly nice to have that sunshine, although it can produce a little bit of a glare for those westbound drivers. But overall, clear traffic conditions right now this evening. As we head through overnight, the road will get a little wet as we have some rain work its way through just before the morning commute begins. Could mix it with a little snow, but watch how quickly it moves in. By 1 o'clock, we're already mostly clearing out here. And as we head through the evening, we'll see one more push of that rain. Our seven-day forecast shows some very nice temperatures. Notice that we don't get below 40 for our highs, which is certainly nice. And lots of sunshine we'll be dealing with here for the next week or so. A chance of some rain tomorrow, like I said, perhaps mixing with a few snow showers and one more chance of rain. But overall, certainly feels like spring is starting or spring has sprung, some may say. Maybe the groundhog wasn't so off after all. Well, thanks, Blake. We're going to have a story about how the Taco Fires hot sauce packets saved a man's life in Oregon. Now, Jeremy Taylor and his dog survived their snow-stranded car in five days in his SUV when it got stuck in snow on a fire service road west of Sun River, Oregon. Jeremy was able to stay warm by occasionally running his car for the five days and eating hot sauce packets as food. Now, the search and rescue team was able to find him, and him and his dog were safe, just a little hungry. And a little while later, Jeremy said that, quote, a Taco Bell fire sauce saves lives. Well, for anyone who criticizes people for having Taco Bell packets in their car, now we know why. And they last forever, so yeah, it's, win -win. it's definitely good to have <laughs> in your car, just in case. I guess so. Who would have known? Yes. Well, we would like to thank all of you for watching this episode of Weather with Blake and Heather. And if you want to see that and more, be sure to check out our Facebook page, BUTV Weather, our Twitter, and also our Instagram, BUTV. Our BUTV Weather Facebook page has helpful forecasts for what you should be able to expect for living in the greater Valparaiso area. Now be sure to share exciting weather events with us. And if you want more to be more connected to us, follow our shows and our stories on YouTube. We have all of our BUTV content on our YouTube and website ValcoViewTV.org for you to rewatch every week. For our next show, we'll be talking about even more current events and the latest on what hopefully isn't too active of a severe weather season. We hope you enjoyed this week's episode. Now be sure to watch our episode of Weather with Blake and Heather coming soon. You won't want to miss it. We'll see you next time.